Creating new projects is really fun, but writing the same code over and over again throughout your application to do the same exact thing over and over is really boring. So in this video, I'm gonna show you 16 different utility functions I use all the time that make writing code quicker and more enjoyable. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And in this video, I'm gonna be covering 16 different utility functions split between four different categories. We have array utilities, DOM-related utilities, formatters, and then other utilities that didn't really fit in these categories. And to start, I really wanna talk about DOM utilities because these are the ones I find the most useful and the ones that save me the most amount of time. So on the left, I have the four different utility functions we're gonna talk about. I also have a script file here that's using all of them. And on the right, I have a demo of that. First, we're gonna talk about the utility functions, then I'm gonna show you the demo and show you why they're so useful. So the first two that I wanna talk about are gonna be QSA and QS. And these are really simple utility functions that just wrap query selector and query selector all. Because all the time you're gonna be writing out document.querySelector and passing it as selector. But the code to write that out is pretty lengthy. So instead, this simple QS function allows you to just write QS and then you can pass it as selector. And by default, it'll use document as the query selector. So by just saying QS and then I could say like dot class, this is going to be the exact same thing as if I wrote out document.querySelector dot class. So this right here just saves you a lot of characters and a lot of space when you're writing and it's really useful. And you can also pass in a parent as a second parameter here. So you could pass in, you know, something else like the window to do your query selector on instead of on the document. QSA is the exact same thing, but for query selector all. But one big difference you'll notice is I actually take this result and I convert it, I spread it out into a new array. And the reason I do that is because query selector all doesn't actually return an array. It returns a very similar object to an array. So by spreading it out into a new array, you get access to methods like find and you get map and reduce and all those other really nice array handy methods that you don't normally get with query selector all. So this is just super handy to have. And the next two that I want to talk about here, we have add global event listener. This is really useful because all the time you want to add an event listener to the document and you want to be able to check when, you know, a button is clicked on your page and you want it to be able to work for all buttons, even new ones that you add to the page, a global event listener that you do on the document is going to be perfect for that. So this handy function just allows doing that so much easier. So you pass in the essentially type of event you want to listen to. You pass in the selector. This is the thing you want to listen for the event on. And then you pass it the callback that you're going to use. It's very similar to a normal event listener, but you pass the selector in there as well. You can also pass in your event listener options as well. And then you can determine whether you want this to be on a document or an individual parent itself. By default, it's going to be on the document. So what this does is it adds an event listener by default to the document for the type you specify. And then all it does is it checks to see if the thing that is being interacted with, whether it's clicked on or whatever, if it matches the selector that you care about. So like if you want to check to see when a button is clicked on, you can say, hey, does this match the button selector? If so, call this callback. And the great way with doing things like this is that if you add a new button to the page, you don't have to add a new event listener for that new button. It's going to be caught by this global event listener. And if you're a bit confused on how event listeners work and why this global event listener works, I have a full tutorial on event listeners in JavaScript that covers why this works. I'm gonna have it linked in the cards and description for you. This is a super handy function. And then finally, the very last function we have is called create element. And this is because creating elements in JavaScript is a real pain. You have to you know, call document create element, and then you have to manually go through and set like the classes, the IDs, the data set, all that other stuff you have to do manually. It'd be so much nicer if you could just pass an object that has all that information and it does it all for you. That's exactly what this function does. You pass it in the type of element you want to create, for example, a div, and you pass it a list of options here, and those options are automatically going to be added onto the element. So for example, we're creating a new element, a div, for example, and we're looping through all those options. And by default, what we're going to do is we're just going to set the attribute. So if you pass in like the key of ID with a value of two, it'll set the ID to two. And the reason that we're doing this by default here is because almost every attribute on an HTML element can be set by doing this. But there's a few attributes that don't work that way. For example, classes have this classless syntax that you need to use. So if we have a class we want to set, we're going to be checking this if. Same thing with data set. We need to check this if here because data set works a little differently. You can't just set it as an attribute. And then finally, if you want to set some text, you have to do that slightly differently as well. That's the only reason these if statements are here. So with that all talked about, what I want to do is I want to go into the script and actually look at how this works. So up here, we're just importing those utilities. And at the very top, we're just selecting all the buttons using QSA. We're selecting the wrapper itself, which is this gray background section right here that you see. And then we're selecting only the buttons that are within the wrapper by saying we want to get the buttons and only the ones with inside the wrapper. As you can see, we get the output. We get six buttons being printed out to the screen. That's because by default, six buttons are on our page. And then down here, we add a new one. So it's going to get all six of those buttons. 
Then you can see if we look below that, we're getting just the wrapper and then we're getting the three buttons that are in the wrapper, excluding the one that's added to the page later. So that works really well. Also, we add some global event listener. So whenever we click on anything that has a button class, which is all of our buttons, it's going to run this e.target.text content. So it's just going to give us the text of the button. We're also adding another global event listener that has the once attribute passed to it. So it's only going to run one time. And then finally, we're adding another global event listener and we're making sure the target here is the wrapper. So this is only going to run on e buttons in the wrapper. So if we click on this two button, you can see it prints out two and one runs once. And if we click it again, that runs once, it doesn't print out anymore. If we click one of the buttons in the modal, you can see it prints out this other text only works in button modal. And that's because we're making sure the parent is the actual wrapper itself for determining where these button global event listeners are working. And this new button also works, which is really handy. If we go down to that new button, you can see we're calling create element. We're saying we want to create a type of button, giving it a class of button, a text to new, we're getting it some data set, an ID, another attribute. And if we expect that button, if we go over to this elements tab here, we go to that button, you can see that that button inside the wrapper has all these attributes, you know, has that data test attribute, has the data high attribute, the ID of new, the class of button, all these properties are being added to it. And this is so much easier for creating an element. Now, this is probably the most complicated set of utilities. So I want to move on to a little bit simpler set, which is going to be our other category. There's only three utilities in here, and they're all really straightforward. The first one I want to talk about is a sleep utility. This is really handy because if you want to like wait a specific amount of time before running some code, there's no good way to do that in JavaScript. The best way to do it is to create a function called sleep and you wrap a promise inside and put a set timeout in it. And that's going to run for the duration. So I would call this by just saying sleep of, for example, 200. And then I could say dot then. And then this code inside the dot then here is only going to run after 200 milliseconds. So having this sleep function is really handy if you want to wait a specific amount of time before running a set piece of code. And this is something you're going to find that you use all the time. And it's really easy to just use a sleep function instead of writing this all out like this. Another really handy function is random number between. This is you're going to pass it a minimum and a maximum, and it's going to return to you an integer value between the minimum and the maximum. So by default, math.random returns a value between zero and one but it doesn't actually return one as the maximum. It can return like 0 0.9999999, but it'll never actually return one. So what we're doing is we're taking that value that's between zero and one with zero being the lowest and almost one being the highest. And we're multiplying it by the difference between our maximum and our minimum, and then we're adding one. So by taking the difference between our max and min, it's essentially like offsetting this number. So if we want to get a number between two and eight, we're going to be multiplying by six taking our random value, multiply it by six, and then we add our minimum onto the end of that. That just makes sure that the lowest value we can get is going to be, for example, our minimum, which in our case is two. And by doing this multiplication, that allows us to get up to that largest value of eight. And the reason we're adding one here is because like I mentioned, math.random only allows you to get to like 0.99999, it never actually returns one. So if we want to actually return a value of one, which is our maximum, we need to add one here. And then we're just taking the floor of this all, and that's converting it down to an actual integer. You're going to see this in use in the arrays utils because we actually use this inside of there for one of the examples. Then finally, the last thing down here is a memwise function. So memoization is essentially the act of saving some data that's computationally slow to perform and then using it later on. I actually have a full tutorial covering memoization. I'm going to link it down in the cards and description for you to check out if you're unfamiliar. Because the way this works is you pass it in a callback and it's returning to you a new function that takes the exact same arguments as your callback. But the nice thing is what it's doing is it's checking to see if you've called this function already with these arguments. And if so, it's returning to you the value that you already got from the previous call of it. This way, if you're doing a very slow calculation, such as like the Fibonacci sequence, this is going to make sure you only calculate each Fibonacci sequence once instead of doing them a huge number of times. So it's really a good performance thing to use. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is going to be those array utilities. Let's open up our array utilities and that script file. I'm just going to close out of all these extras here. So you can see here, instead of our array utils, we have five different functions inside of here. And if we just take a look at the output here, you can see our output on the right hand side. Now, these different functions are just really simple functions that you're going to use all the time. For example, this first function called first, it takes in an array. And if n equals one, which is the default, it's just going to return to you the first element in that array. Otherwise, if you pass it something like three for n, it's going to return to you the first three elements in that array. Last is the exact same thing, but it's doing it the opposite direction. It's going to return to you either just the last element or the last, you know, n number of elements that you want to get from that array. You can kind of see the output over on the right of what we do when we call first or first with three, for example. 
Sample is a great function because a lot of times you just want to get a random value inside of an array. And doing that is a little bit annoying in JavaScript because you have to write out a pretty lengthy amount of code, especially if you don't have this helper function already defined. But with us, we can just get a random number between zero and our array length minus one. And we can just use that random integer to get a random value from the array. It's a super handy function that I wish was built into JavaScript. Now these final two are a little bit more complex. Pluck is essentially saying, hey, you know what? I have an array of objects and I wanna get just one particular key from that object. So if you have an array of people that have a name and an age, you can pass in your array of people and you can say that the key is name. And this is just going to return to you a new array that has just the names of each person in that array. Group by is similar in that what it's doing is taking an array and a key and it's grouping all of the elements in the array by that key. So let's say you wanted to get all the users with the same age, you could group by age and this is going to return to you a object that has a key for each age and then the value for that is going to be an array of all the elements that match that specific age. Let's take a look at the examples here. Our first array up here just goes A through G, all the letters of the alphabet, and you can see we're returning the first letter, first three letters, the last letter, last three letters, and then just a random letter. And on the right hand side you can see the output of that and as you can see it's working as expected. Also we have an array of people here that have ages and names and what we're doing here is we're plucking out the name. We're just getting the name for each individual user. And as you can see, it prints out the name, Kyle, John, Mike, Jill, Sally, just the name of each person. Finally, down here for group by, we're grouping by the age of each person. So if we go down to the group by here, you can see we have an object which has the keys 18, 21, 24, and 26, because those are all the unique ages for our people. And inside of here, you can see all the people at the age of 18, all the people at the age of 24. And down here, these two people have the exact same age of 26, so they're both inside of that array for the value of 26. Now there's tons of other array utility methods that you could create, but these are the ones that I find myself using the most often. Now the final category that I wanna talk about is going to be formatters, and formatters are gonna be different ways that you can format things like numbers, dates, and strings, and so on. And I'm just covering a few of the more important use cases. Let's just look at the actual formatters themselves before we dive into the code. As you can see, we have four different formatters. We have one for formatting currency, one for formatting a number, one for formatting a compact number, and then finally formatting relative dates. So we'll start with formatting number because that's by far the easiest. All we're doing is we're using this INTL number format. And INTL number format stands for internationalization number format, and it allows you to format numbers in a way that's specifically for the actual locale of the user. So if someone's in Spain versus the US, the numbers are going to be formatted slightly differently. As you can see over here, we have our number formatter and it's using commas for delineating different groups and a period for the decimal place. Well, if we change this, for example, to Spanish, and we save, you can now see that the number is using decimals to divide different groups and commas for the decimal point at the end. And this is just how Spanish is formatted versus English. And if you just leave undefined here as the default, like we are, what this is specifically saying is use whatever the default locale of the user on the computer is. So for me, since I live in the US, my default locale is US. And as you can see up here, the default number is just you know, a JavaScript number, and this is returning a string that has all that extra formatting. Now, format currency is very similar. Again, we're passing undefined here, but we're passing a few options. For example, we're saying the style of this number formatter should be a currency format, and that the currency we're formatting is US dollars. So when we call that formatter for our number, you can see that it's putting the dollar sign at the front for the US dollar, and it's formatting it in a way that works for US dollars. For example, in the US dollar system, we go down to pennies, which are one one hundredth of a dollar, which is why it's cutting this off after two decimal places. While the number actually has six decimal places, it's cutting it off at two. Same thing down here with compact number. It's very similar, except for we're just saying that, hey, our notation is going to be compact. And now you can see our compact number says 9.1 M for 9.1 million. So this gives you a much smaller, more compact version of your number. So like for example, YouTube views on a video, they're going to be listed out as like, you know, 1.7 K or 1.7 M to represent thousands or millions instead of writing out such a super long number. Now the final formatter I wanna talk about is this format relative date. And this one is quite a bit more confusing. I actually have an entire blog article that goes really in depth in this formatter as well as this entire function itself. If you wanna check out, I'll link it in the description. But essentially what this does is it's saying, hey, you know what, I wanna figure out relatively where this date is in relation to a specific date or our current date. So you pass it in a date and you pass it in another date which defaults to the current date. And it's saying, hey, give me the time between these two dates and format it in a way that's like English readable, like you know, human readable instead of like a number or something. So what this does is it gets the duration between those two dates in seconds, and then it takes this divisions array up here. And this divisions array just has a name, for example, seconds, minutes, hours, days, and it has an amount. So there's 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, and so on, all the way down to years, which is our maximum thing. So that's why we have such a large number here. 
And all we're doing is we're looping through each one of these and we're saying, hey, you know what? Is our duration, the duration between these two things, smaller than the amount? So if we have, for example, 30 seconds between our to date and our from date, well, 30 is less than 60, so it's going to say true, and it's going to format using our duration as well as the division we want, which in our case is seconds. If, for example, we have 120 seconds between these, so like two minutes, well, this is gonna say, you know what? 120 is not less than 60, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our current duration, divide by that amount, which is 60, to get us essentially two. It's going to reduce us down to a minute scale instead of a second scale. And it's going to do that over and over again until it finds out which one of these categories we fall into, whether it's based on seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, and so on. And as you can see on our output over here, we have a bunch of different things being outputted. So if we go to our script over here, we can look at all of these. For example, we have our large number here, as you can see, and by default, it's just going to print out this large number. If we do a currency formatter, you can see it has the dollar sign and all that. Number is going to print it out with separators. Compact is going to be compact. And then down here, we have our relative date formats. We have multiple different ways of doing this. So I created four different dates. We have our current date, we have the date for two months ago, we have yesterday, and then we have a date from nine days ago. So if we come in here and we do format relative date and we pass it in two months ago, you can see it's gonna print out the text two months ago. So it's English readable, human readable. And the reason it's doing that is because we're using this relative time format. And again, it's using English as the default. I could change this to Spanish, for example, whoops. And now if I save, you can see it's printing that out in Spanish because that is the locale for the particular user on this computer. But in my case, I'm using undefined so that it uses whatever the locale of the specific user is. Now, if we go back over to our script again, you can see yesterday, it's printing out the text yesterday because it's only one day ago. You can also see here nine days ago is printing out last week. So it's saying, hey, this is approximately sometime last week. And then finally, we're doing a comparison between two separate days here, so yesterday and nine days ago. And this is saying, hey, that's happening next week because yesterday is one week away from nine days ago, or essentially it's relatively one week away. And that's the nice thing about this format relative date is it's not exact. It's not saying, oh, this is nine days, 36 you know, seconds and four minutes ago. It's saying, you know, sometime last week. So that's really nice if you just need to have like on Twitter, for example, if a tweet happened more than a day ago, it'll say, you know what, this is from yesterday or it's gonna be from last week or last month and so on. And those are 16 amazing utilities I use all the time. If you're interested in a very React specific version of this, I have a React Hooks video like that linked over here, which I highly recommend you check out. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.